Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Audrey Tronlom. I serve as the Environmental Health Program Manager at the University of Northern Iowa Center for Energy and Environmental Education. Um, it's absolutely my privilege to be able to introduce our next speaker, Ense Witherspoon, um, <coughs> Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. I've had the great good fortune of being able to work with Ense through the Cancer Free Economy Network for the last, ooh, couple years now, yeah. And I've very, very recently joined her on the board of the Pesticide Action Network of North America, um, which is basically like all of my dreams are coming true, being able to work with Ense. Um, Let's see here. I'm, I'm pretty committed to keeping my opening remarks short, which means I'm, the irony of this, Liz, is that I'm gonna be shirking the one responsibility that I had uh, and asking you all to please read Ensei's very impressive bio on the conference website um, because I want to be able to share a little bit with you about why I'm so excited that Ensei is able to join us for today uh, and, and why I was just thrilled that she accepted the invitation to come and share her expertise in children's environmental health and environmental carcinogens with us all. So as sort of alluded to in the last, the last few sessions now, cancer develops through a combination of many factors and environmental exposures that often occur simultaneously. This means that genetics alone do not determine whether or not an individual will de develop cancer in many cases. The environment really is the context in which we're all sort of nestled and which disease is nestled also. When it comes to carcinogens in our environment, exposure to a single pollutant may only pose a small risk to an individual. However, if widespread, exposure can result in significant number of cancer cases across a population. What's more, people are rarely exposed to a single carcinogen. In fact, people are often exposed to multiple pollutants and other substances at the same time that can impact cancer risk at any given stage of the life course. The more a population is exposed, and this is some silver lining, the greater number of cases of cancer that can be prevented by reducing those exposures. This is why it's so important to really reduce exposures and environmental carcinogens in the environment wherever possible. Now, Ense was the person who taught me this much more nuanced ways of thinking through and appreciating environmental carcinogens and chemicals impact on um, cancer development. And I know she'll be speaking much more specifically in her talk about particular carcinogens of concern. Um, but she taught me sort of this systems thinking way of this approach. Um, now, not only is Ense a very, very skilled communicator in the important relationship of population-wide prevention efforts, um, population-wide cancer <laughs> prevention efforts, um, especially as it relates to the most vulnerable among us, um, she is also one of the strongest voices and advocates for these issues that I know, and I'm so, so pleased to be able to share her with you all today. So I'm going to pass the mic to Ense now. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, being a public health leader, I'm going to have to ask y'all, please stand up, stretch. Uh, I know it's a lot of sitting and all for wonderful reasons, but it is tough, right, to do that. So please do stand, stretch, whatever makes you comfortable, um, just so that, and I, again, I know that I'm like the tail end after lunch, which is always <laughs> challenging. Uh, but while you're doing that, I, again, it's such an honor. Thank you to the consortium for this very kind invitation. I came in last night from Washington, D.C. I have to shuffle back right after this, and we're going to have some meetings with the administration tomorrow. Uh, but I also want to give a land acknowledgement um, that we are on the traditional and ancestral unceded lands of the Bakaoje and Inoue Sac and Mikowski people. And just want to acknowledge that the land acknowledgement alone is not uh, the, the benefit here. The benefit is to remind us all how respectful I hope I will be in my discussion that we are on this land uh, and that we uh, you know, listen to the fruits of our ancestors and make sure that we're doing everything accordingly to be good stewards of our environment and, of course, our health. So again, I'm with the Children's Environmental Health Network. If you don't know about us, we're celebrating 30 years this year. We actually had an anniversary gala a couple weeks ago. We don't do that often, but every now and again, we do celebrate these milestones. Um, and I am the third director in line, and I think our director would say, our founding director would certainly say that never would they have thought in their wildest dreams that three decades later from their start that there would still be a need for a national group with a focus on protecting all children from environmental hazards. 
I mean, it seems pretty intuitive, right? I mean, most of us want the next generation to be better, safer, healthier, to not go through the same cycles of mistakes. And yet here we are, almost in the year 2023, and I would say a country that has a lot of resources and, compared to three decades ago, a lot of science, peer-reviewed science that shows us we can and need to be doing better. So our mission has always been the same, protect all children from environmental hazards, to make sure that the places where they spend the most time in, their homes, their schools, their early learning environments, their communities, their synagogues, their churches, grandma's house, you name it, are not causing harm unbeknownst to them. And in order to do this work, we conduct a lot of different programs. A uh, majority of our work is taking the science. At times, we're a part of the science. We lead what's called the Children's Environmental Health Research Translation Centers through the National Institutes of Health, which is a very big responsibility, making sure that the science that's being developed is translated in a way that all of us benefit, right? As has been discussed a few times, peer-reviewed journals are important, but the science does not do much for us if it just stays stagnant in a journal. We need to know as parents, as consumers, as residents in this world, you know, what does this mean to better my life, my decision making? Uh, my husband and I are parents to four. Uh, and so it's very important, it's very personal, right? As well as children who I have never met, um, I have this calling to make sure that we again stand up for them when they can't be there for themselves. We also do a lot of translation of the science. So that's a heavy part of our portfolio. So education, curriculum development, translation into child protective policies and actions that will have long-standing implications for generations to come. And uh, again, provide leadership and provide that constant, what about kids? What will said policy standards? What about the lack and void of said policies? How will that impact children of today and tomorrow? So we're the only organization of our kind in the nation with this mission, and we do international work as well. We are a leader in climate change, cancer prevention, water, air, major modes of transmission, um, and of course, places where kids spend a lot of time. We coordinate the NIH centers, which I said. We're on a variety of advisory committees and boards, and again, we are the, again, the go-to, you know, we need that child health perspective at this table, which is great. That wasn't happening 30 years ago. And we definitely uh, provide a variety of resources like uh, state profiles. How is the state of children's environmental health in my state? And we don't have one on Iowa yet. So I know I'm working with Audrey and others to see if we can shake <laughs> some resources because I think it's a great uh, pillar for um, uh, engagement with your policy leaders, with your respected advocacy leaders to get a sense of the challenges, the things we still need to attain for, and the positive things happening to grow from. So just to give you a frame of where I am coming from you, I'm definitely coming from a systems approach, right? What we have learned definitely, the hard way I'd say over the many decades is this one by one, and I've heard this throughout today, this one by one siloed approach is it's giving us incremental steps forward, but it's not the monumental shift change that we need. I'm talking about educational shifts in our educational systems, our childcare systems, and certainly a variety of other systems that unfortunately got us to this place of where we are struggling, I would say, to keep up with the available science to do better for communities, especially when it, when it comes to environmental exposures. I'm also very framed with a strong economic um, and, and equity and justice, racial justice frame. I refer back to Nelson Mandela often when I'm speaking and thinking of on those hard days. And this, among many of his quotes, really resonates with me. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it we treats its children. So I would say, until we do right by our children and the ones yet to be born, uh, we have a long way to go. So, if I was to get into all of the environmental exposure pathways that all people, especially our most vulnerable like children, ex are exposed to every day, we would not have enough time. So there's a couple highlights here. And I'm happy to talk with folks offline more. And hopefully we'll be doing more work with you all. PFAS, perfluoral alkyl substances, are a class of chemicals that many of you probably have heard about more and more in the news. Uh, exposure pathways are a lot. Water, especially old or, or current military bases that have caused contribution to water runoff and water co um, contamination as one of many. This slide shows, you know, PFAS are in those non-toxic pans. They're in the foam that firefighters uh, use. You know, many different ways that they're used. Um, uh, furniture, you know, different types of insulation. So we cannot get away from them. And this is one of those things where, you know, it seems so overwhelming and, and so incredibly challenging to overcome, and yet they are a suite of carcinogens. So we can't avoid these exposures, and we have to figure out how to reduce exposure as fast as we can. 
Now looking at these trends, I bring this up. This is actually from the uh, Pesticide Action Network, their Generation in Jeopardy report from 2012. So you might say, why am I still bringing this up? The sad part is these trends have not changed uh, in almost 10 years now. Uh, the, the health outcomes for children are all clearly going the wrong way. You know, we used to be dealing with infectious disease, major outs of exposures. Now we're dealing with these chronic um, concerns. And they're going all the wrong way, and all of them have evidence-based, science-peer-reviewed uh, connections to certain forms of environmental exposures. I'm also, again, very framed in this equity justice lens. We will not get where we need to go with any of our goals in this country and beyond if we don't, do not acknowledge that certain marginalized populations who least contribute to our uh, c contamination and our energy crisis and our climate crisis, but yet bear the biggest burden of them, uh, we have to make sure that we're framed, I would say, from a child health perspective, which uh, can, um, includes our most vulnerable of populations and what they can sustain, and the most marginalized within our communities as well. So there's a piece that I did recently with the Chisholm Legacy Project called Racism That Appends the Cradle, and we're going to do a few more of these, but this really gets into how the endemic has impacted black children in particular. So COVID-19, the climate crisis, economic disinvestment, um, and overall in environmental injustice. Again, the climate crisis, I've mentioned this a few times, we again will not reach the goals that we need to as far as optimum health outcome, optimum environmental conservation, and many of the other great benefits in between if we don't think about these movements together. And of course, when we're cleaning up our environment, cleaning up our water, cleaning up our air, which are non-negotiable, our food supply, which you all know about very well in this state, these are all aspects that we need to survive, right? It's non-negotiable, it doesn't matter what the zip code you live in, the economics that you have, uh, we all need these to survive. And we are all seeing the negative repercussions of not addressing in a very concerted, targeted way the climate crisis as well as I would say our environmental injustice movement. But there are many things missing, right? And that's what a lot of what we do. So urgent focus implications on children in any of the related movements that I've discussed. What about the urgent connections to the short-term and the long-term health of children? I would make the case that there are states certainly already, and with the th three decades of our work with them too, putting children first in their standard setting, putting children first in their policy development, and they're seeing and reaping the benefits of that years, decades later. There are a variety of inequities, of course, in current existing policies and standards. How do we update those and make them much more attainable? What about mental health and trauma? I mean, these are the un you know, documented, the unforeseen, you know, the status quo stig stigmatized implications of climate disasters, of environmental injustice, of negative health outcomes, right? And most, if not all, families are seeing this within their family networks. And again, learning environments. We are missing a lot of where children spend the majority of their time. There's, you're hard pressed to find a lot of peer-reviewed science in early learning child care environments. One of the many silver linings, we never wanted COVID to happen, but one of the silver linings has been, I have never heard childcare talked about in the public media space more than I have in the last two and a half years. So let's hope that there's a bump up now of focused attention, not just money, but targeted attention for understanding that the places where our youngest of our children, where their little brains are still developing, even two years into their toddler years, their respiratory systems are still developing, their musculoskeletal systems still developing. The place where they spend 40 plus hours or more for the average American uh, young child in this country before they even go to K through 12 schools is vital. Also, let's not forget, this is a place predominantly dominated by women, many of women childbearing age. So what they are also exposed to during these critical windows of development could have generational impacts. So there's many benefits to making sure we don't miss our early learning environments. So let's look at Iowa a bit. Your top 20 for the release of harmful chemicals and greenhouse gases, unfortunately, in the United States. And the Iowa Environmental Council has made it clear that um, with over 750 lakes, streams, and rivers, there are a lot of concerns with pollution. And again, Iowa is not by yourself. This is a, the concerns all over the country. There was a study just last year that found that vulnerable populations in small rural towns experienced significantly more public health challenges compared to statewide. And those cities were Ottawa, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Perry, and Mashalton, and I'm saying that right? Those were the three that were in that uh, study. 
And then we look at you know, some of the national numbers. I mean, this is uh, relevant to every single state. 95% of Americans are believed to have traces of detectable amounts of those chemical causing uh, PFOS chemicals, those carcinogens that I mentioned. So again, if we did a body burden test on all of us, you could be living the, what you think is the cleanest lifestyle. <laughs> and unfortunately, we also know babies are born pre-polluted. You haven't even left the hospital yet. And if you were to test a young baby, which has been done, they already have traces of very harmful chemicals that were never meant to enter the body, many of them known carcinogens. And obesity has been talked about. Mental health illness, distress, infant mortality, premature death. This is seen across the country, per that earlier graph I show you. Iowa is no different. You're seeing this, and unfortunately, these are, rates are going up, according to Is Iowa's Health Improving a recent report. So there are some investments, right? You heard earlier from the Centers for Disease Control, and I know at one point, uh, I'm not sure if it's current, uh, there was funding coming in from the CDC's Environmental Health Tracking Program as supports other states in the country. And in pesticides, right, these, these chemicals that are used in agricultural and indoor environments and for many other uses, 15% of Iowans use private wells identifying high pesticide use, and the idea is there by identifying these problems that it would help the Iowa Department of Public Health determine if education or related intervention would be needed or if new regulations or guidelines are needed for monitoring drinking wells. So that's a starting place, right? So it's one thing to, to at least have the data. It's a whole other thing as far as what you do with the data as has also been discussed. On nitrates, the discussion of nitrates, private and public water supply data and cancer data is, look, is being looked at simultaneously. You know, looking at these data sets and, and molding together, what are the lessons learned between the two so that, again, we can do better, as my six-year-old daughter says often. When we know better, we should be doing better. And when you think about water exposures and nitrate exposures in our drinking water supply and the connections to cancer that are well evidenced in our peer-reviewed science, the work to link those associations and the health effects data uh, will really uh, prove to be beneficial to this state and others. Iowa City is selected as an Invest Health Partner. So this is a collaboration between Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Reinvestment Fund, and it develops new strategies for increasing and leveraging private and public investments for accelerating improvements in neighborhoods that are facing the biggest barriers to better health. So the Iowa program is looking at efforts to reduce asthma disparities, depression, behavioral health diagnosis in children, and adults among low-income families and underrepresented groups. That's an awesome investment, and I have no doubt there will be positive returns that can be modeled across the country. So there are many ways, I mean many ways, this is just a highlight of some of the policy advocacy uh, efforts that are happening and asks that are being asked of some of your advocate groups in the state. So the Iowa Department of Natural Resources is calling for Envi the Environmental Health Commission to adopt rules requiring water pollution monitoring systems at all feedlots. Seems pretty basic, you know, so that should be something that hopefully could be supported. The Des Moines City Council is demanding a franchise agreement with the Mid-American Energy that extends related to clean energy goal till 2035 and serves also many climate goals. So the proposal would include options to terminate at three years, three to eight years, the commitments if they are not being met by this company. So there's a sense of accountability here, right? Again, plans are only as good as they are as implemented. And the intent and good intent is pretty obvious. Either you're doing what you should be doing or you're not. I would highly support there be a consideration for those in the room that can do these type of things to support such an agreement and showing these industries that you mean business. Because again, they have goals that they're setting. Who's holding them accountable for those goals? Supporting the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Act. That was introduced by Congressman Betty McCollum and uh, four original co-sponsors, and that would be coordinating restoration and resilience work up and down the Mississippi corridor, a vital waterway. And then all electric incentives for new buildings, asking the city council to uphold 2050 net zero greenhouse gas emission goals by moving to vote in all electric incentivizing for new, new buildings. And I will tell you, our building structure are some of the biggest energy uh, consumers, right? This is a big part of our uh, climate strategies. We have to think about how to think about our regenerative energy uh, dynamics for the buildings that we unfortunately spend a lot of time in. So that also would be highly uh, supported by an organization like ourselves. And there are many wonderful groups, if you don't already know about them, that are very much interested in crossing this bridge between environmental and public health, environmental uh, exposures. You, of course, have the Iowa Environmental Council, 
There is Pesticide Action Network of North America, based in California, but they have an office here in Iowa that myself and Audrey are on the board on, and Sankar was also up on board as well. And then Iowa Environmental Health um, Association, Iowa Public Health Association. You may not know about the Mid-America Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Has anyone heard of that one? Yay, Audrey, okay. <laughs> so every region of the country, in accordance to every EPA region, has a pediatric environmental health specialty unit. They're not funded highly. They don't have a lot of marketing dollars, so not surprising you don't know about them. They have 1-800 toll-free numbers. Uh, they have websites, and they are there for any related env children's environmental health exposure you might have a concern about. If you're a teacher, if you're a parent, uh, if you have any other interactions with a child and you just want to you know, you want to disclose this and, and get some uh, referral, they will even referral all the way to clinical care if needed. Uh, these are public health trained case managers and they're always associated with a pediatric hospital or nursing hospital or consortium. So highly recommend you check them out because they're a resource right here in your region. Uh, and they do education and training mandates as well. So getting back to climate change and these connections to chemical exposures. Uh, one of the ways, I want to tell you some national efforts that are happening that I think you should know about and that could also be beneficial to you um, here in Iowa. We're releasing this fall the Climate Equity Collaborative. So uh, you're hard pressed to, think, to find any acknowledgement or efforts that are blending climate change, climate injustice, children's environmental health, and equity needs. So we are trying to do that on a domestic and international level. So this is a public-private partnership the notion is that if we keep waiting for our federal government or our state governments to be able to have the capacity to fund the kind of urgent levels of change that we need, we're not going to get there. So we're going to be looking at sustainable tech industry, who certainly do have the capacity and funding to fund this effort. And again, it's an idea of bringing business partners together with already existing programs that have shown return on value, that they are making a difference for our climate goals, as well as our public health and um, environmental health goals. So we're elevating knowledge and leadership by funding and supporting already existing programs that are showing benefits that could be modeled across the country and in states like Iowa if interested, as well as resources and tools that we can all benefit from. We're providing more engagement and on-ramps because a lot of these industries have not been working together, certainly not the tech industry in this space, and they, by, uh, quite frankly, have a lot of responsibility in this space. A lot of them do not have uh, pristine uh, records when it comes to not contributing to our environmental woes. Driving investment, so thinking about and encouraging our tech industry and many other serious investor, investors to look at this realm of, of, uh, of uh, partnership versus these siloed funding approaches. And then elevating children's environmental health in this whole field because, again, you're hard-pressed to find climate discussions and climate and children all being discussed at the same time. We have our Eco-Healthy Child Care Program. It's been running for 15 years. It's the only program of this country uh, program in the country working to train and educate child care professionals on low to no cost steps they can take to protect themselves and the children that they are, entrust are entrusted in for their care. So we have two sides of this. We have a curriculum side that's been peer reviewed and it keeps going for peer review and review every year. And we work with the who's who in child care associations, accreditation, licensing. They give us on a voluntary basis their their, their support and their guidance and they help frame this whole program because they recognize this is a gap that's otherwise not being supported in their field by current training programs. So this is online, we can also do it in person and it helps with them with their licensing credits that they need for child care professionals anyway. The other side of it is a 30 item checklist. So you can download it, we can send it to you. Out of 30 items, uh, a provider or a center must adhere to at least 25 practices. And you give us a sense of, you know, for example, our pesticides sprayed monthly. How is that done? Why? What are the, what's the decision making for that? Who's coming in? What are they spraying? These are just some of the basic things we ask. Nine times out of ten, there's really no need for that company to come in and spray a harmful unknown chemical, which usually is not being adhered to. You're supposed to not be in the same room for 72 hours at least. It's supposed to be well ventilated. A lot of these centers are spraying on a Thursday, and the children and the, everyone is in by Friday morning. You keep doing that every month. 12 times a year, that's a lot of exposure, just as one example. So we give them practices that don't usually cost much of how they can just change their behaviors to benefit the center, reduce costs, and increase health. And we provide a range of technical assistance as well. So any way that we can help bring this program into centers here in the state, we're ready to go.
The Cancer Free Economy Network that I work on with these lovely colleagues back here, I've been at that table for about seven, eight years, and there's a lot of places that we're asked to be at. I'm at that table because this is transformational. It's focused on a systems approach, the fact that we need cancer treatment. No one's negating that. We need that. All of us probably are connected to someone, if not multiple people with cancer or are ourselves dealing with cancer. The reality is the science shows there is a peer-reviewed science available linking certain trends of environmental exposures to certain forms of cancer that are not being adhered to that could prevent, in many cases, certain diagnosis of cancer and other long-term illnesses. But we are not setting up our communities to be proactive about that. And to be honest with you, there's no funding for that. Funding is always on the treatment side. So we need to be advocates of preventive strategies and preventive funding, me funding mechanisms that, again, marry the treatment needs, not taking away from treatment, adding on to. So we're also, we're broken down into health science. I co-chair our health science side of it, existing science, lifting it up, making sure that associations and healthcare associations and many advocates, including cancer advocates, have what they need to be the advocates they need in their networks. We have the only joint statement on cancer prevention. Our last speaker spoke about the need to have healthcare professionals in this field, of course, certainly. So we have a joint statement that provides uh, healthcare associations for the first time working with cancer serving organizations making a very public statement that we can prevent certain forms of cancer so we need to be doing that. Um, we have a market shift side of this because this is a lot, a lot of this is economically driven. We didn't just get here by chance. Uh, we have to rely, uh, admit the fact that our consumer uh, system is very much dependent on an economy that relies on synthetic chemicals and a lot of these chemicals are not tested for human health implications before they're put on the market, before they're put into products that we buy or the food that comes into our homes. We have a whole policy side to this, a legal side to this, and a strong communication. Cheering, changing the narrative, yes, we need cancer treatment, and we can work on prevention. So we're also working with the Cancer Moonshot, the President's administration, on trying to uh, take their leverage and their platform to understand that prevention has many angles here. There was discussion earlier, the great session earlier, about childhood cancer. So we were part of the release of the ch this first ever childhood cancer report a couple years ago with the Childhood Cancer Prevention Initiative. And this report is, again, we didn't do any new science. We just surveyed available science and pulled it together. And what it showed us is that, again, childhood cancer incidents since 1975, the year I was born, 47 years, has consistently been going up in incidents. Yes, we're doing better on mortality. Yes, there are less children dying from certain forms of cancer. But as was discussed earlier, and I will articulate again, being a cancer survivor of any state, especially a young child for the rest of your life, is not a walk in the park. So we know that um, there's a steady rise in this incidence. Most of the common causes, again, are, um, or types of cancer are leukemia, lymphomas, brain, central nervous. Uh, rates of leukemia are highest among Latinx um, communities, and there are some connections there related to our disparity data. Again, there's an economic and social burden. So you have increase of other forms of cancer has been discussed. Also sleep disturbances, learning disabilities, concerns with holding and maintaining a job and profession. For the rest of your life, there are existing associations now and groups that have come together just connecting childhood cancer survivors so that they can be support networks. How do you go to college when you can't focus? You know, What about when you're starting to start thinking about a family and now you're dealing with infertility, um, among many other challenges? Uh, work limitations, missed days of work, economic disenfranchisement, not to mention the economic stress, mental stress for the family that then has to care for that young child. Clean Water for All is another coalition I'd love for you to know about. Uh, again, when we think about major pathways, water is huge. So we're working to just ensure that everyone has equitable access to clean, um, accessible, safe water for all uses, including recreational uses. So if we can be of help to you, you know, please let us know. Uh, we're elevating the Clean Water Act. We were just at the, our office is right next to the Supreme Court. We were just all together at the Supreme Court a couple weeks ago. Uh, the Sackett versus EPA case is one I'd love to bring up to you. If this, the Supreme Court is hearing this right now. If the Sacketts win uh, over the Environmental Protection Agency for the United States, this will be a whole change on the definition of protected waters in the United States. They will, re they will reduce <laughs> um, the amount of um, oversight that our Environmental Protection Agency can have to regulate our waters for public health best practices and standard. That impl impacts all of us. That would be a huge step backwards. So that's just one of a few examples of how we're trying to be out there, trying to make sure that public health and uh, the needs of vulnerable population like children lead the way in decision making. 
Also, I'd like to mention America, um, the beautiful for all. This is um, an effort through the Biden administration uh, where there's been an, um, a goal to protect 30 percent of our lands and our waterways by the year 2030, if not sooner, the urgency to be sooner. And uh, that's an effort that I co-chair along with Green Latinos and the Wilderness Society. They're meeting right now in D.C. Uh, but also the part of this is that 30 protected 30 percent of those protected lands would benefit at least 40 percent of marginalized communities. So you can imagine the conundrum we have of elevating and, and making sure that our measure of success are accurate and um, are able to tell that story. They're audacious goals. They're big. And we do need that. We're at a time where we need just that. The incremental steps were passed. We have to be very urgent and audacious. And the benefits is that, again, we'll all benefit. Every state will benefit when those goals are met. Uh, so I'm not at all undermining um, how big of a challenge we have. By the beginning of January, we'll have policy platforms from that initiative uh, that work with this administration on how we get to those goals. So we're happy to share where we are with those and what those might mean for your state cancer plan. I do want to acknowledge and applaud you for having a state cancer plan and a plan that actually has an environmental health component. That's a rare <laughs> situation, so you should be very proud of all the energy and time that's gone into that. I'm sure it will only get better and stronger as you implement it, and we stand ready in the many coalitions that we are part of to do whatever we can to make sure that your Iowa cancer plan is effective and successful. And I've heard rumors about a, a climate plan maybe for the state, so that would also be another one if that does come to fruition. Those would definitely work hand in hand uh, if I haven't made that clear enough. And I'll just end here with this uh, point from Paul Dressel with Race Matters Institute that the route to achieving equity will not be accomplished through treating everyone equally. It will be accomplished by treating everyone justly according to their circumstances. So meeting people where they are is one thing. Making sure that any proposed solutions or implementations or what we think might be best for people will only be as good as the information that they give us as far as what will be meaningful for them to make the better informed behavior decisions, to overcome the challenges to living a healthier lifestyle, and to making sure that they have the help of advocates in the state that understand sometimes you can do all the right things and still uh, find yourself with a negative health um, consequence that I would offer could have some environmental components that are beyond your personal control. That's why, again, there's a need for us to be much bigger in our policy development and our standard setting and to at least make sure that environmental contributions are a part of the solutions and not left out, which all too often they are. And uh, we have a children's environmental health movement. Uh, every third Thursday of October is Child Health Month. We encourage and would love this consortium to be an official partner. It's a time for us to take a step back and just appreciate the successes, the milestones, the resources, the ways we've connected uh, with our community, with our youth in particular, what we've learned from them and to roll up our sleeves and dig in for the next year. Because again, these issues did not happen overnight. They won't be solved overnight. But the more the masses, the stronger we get, the, powerful, the more powerful we get. Uh, and there are many other things we're doing. We have proclamations, Children's Environmental Health Day proclamations. And there are some uh, all over the country. And these are engagement tools. So going into your school board meetings, going into your policy leader meetings, and making it clear that uh, you know we collectively, as a consortium here in this case, uh, know that that we can do better for Iowa. So how do we do this together? It's going to take everyone. It's going to take policy leaders with our agricultural leaders, with our justice leaders, with our child health uh, policy leaders to come together singing the same tune. Um, so again, this systems approach, breaking these systems. And these are my four kiddos who keep me motivated every day and the millions that I don't ever meet uh, who really uh, keep me jazzed to do this work um, each and every day. So thanks again for the invite. And happy to engage in a discussion. Oh my gosh, Ensei, thank you so much. Um, I obviously will be turning the floor over to you all to ask questions, but I'm going to take the moderator pri privilege to ask the first one. Um, I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear you talk about climate change in your presentations. It's such an important piece to overall environmental health, of course, but there is sort of a um, not well articulated often relation to the petrochemical industry. And I think it, it just might be useful if you would maybe break that down a little bit more um, and how chemical exposures are related to petrochemicals. 
Yep, sure. So, and Audrey has been helping us with our climate toxics work group of the Cancer Free Economy Network. So this is very much in your wheelhouse and you should jump into. Uh, so again, going back to this economic dependency, um, after the Industrial Revolution, you know, depression, all of that, we had booms, right, and industrial booms, and that's been great, and they created jobs, and they created livelihoods for families that they may not have had otherwise. There's a downside to innovation. I mean, including our cell phones of today, and our cars, and, and all of these uh, computers, these conveniences that we all benefit from. We have not done well in our history of balancing out those pros and cons when it comes to public health. And now we're in a predicament where we are quickly scrambling and trying to catch up. And sadly, I would say the canary in the coal mine, bad analogy, is that our children become those indicators of how well we're doing. I could throw that slide back up there. And again, <laughs> I don't know that we've lived in a time since we've been tracking where all of those health outcomes are as negative as they are and continuing to rise in the wrong direction. Genetics alone cannot answer those questions and those trends. Uh, you have to then look at where people are spending their time, what they're exposed to, and again, you can't leave environmental exposures out of that. The huge flux of chemicals, industrial-related chemicals, synthetic chemicals that we produce in the United States and outside every year that enter our commerce through uh, products, through emission of plants and coal-burning fire, fire fired power plants, just to name a few, the cars we drive. The, the report that I mentioned, childhood cancer trends are closely related to pesticide exposures, which Dot mentioned earlier, um, emissions from our cars for air pollution concerns, and paints and solvents. Those are the largest connections in the broadest sense to childhood cancers that we know that is in the peer-reviewed science. And tell me if there's any standards or policies that you're aware of that are making sure that we don't continue to have those exposures. We're just kind of going through. So just like mercury and other emissions and many known carcinogens are being emitted into our air and our water every day, the same thing has been happening as far as the type of chemicals entering our products that we then bring into our homes and or put on our bodies or otherwise maybe are eating through our food. So it's been this multiple array confounding exposure pathways, we'd say, that there's definitely, when you look at our history here in the United States, had an incredibly huge boom with the Industrial Revolution and the, and the um, intentional use of these chemicals for their benefit, but not at all considering the health consequences of anyone, nonetheless the young vulnerability of a child. Mm. The climate piece is that the more polluted our air is, the, the, the more you know, carbon that we're emitting, the more um, inability to clean up our, our various systems and our exposure pathways, it's caused a negative detriment. That's yet another. There's negative health consequences and there's been negative environmental consequences to our actions. So is it all human made? No, but it's a huge contributor uh, to, again, the negative uh, environmental crisis that we're in when it comes to increased heat, uh, increased um, extreme weather patterns, which I know you all witness. There's no place in the world anymore that doesn't witness some form of climate implications uh, when we're honest with ourselves. Yeah, thank you, Ensei. I think that, you know, really breaking it down into this sort of twin problem, like chemicals and chemical exposures and climate change coming from this petrochemical source is something that sort of broke my brain open when I first learned about it, realizing that this was, like I said, this twin problem. I have backup questions as a moderator, but I need to make sure that you all <laughs> have a chance. So I have a question from our virtual attendees. It's actually from a coworker, um, she's our new CDC PHAP and is really into environmental health types things. So great. she's blowing up my phone with questions great, for you. Great. <laughs> um, so she says, uh, her name's Caroline. She says, agribusiness plays a huge role in promoting pesticide use that is especially harmful to farm workers and their families. Can taking a children's health-centered approach help or be uh, more effective, be a more effective avenue to take in advocacy and policy efforts to restrict yeah. their use? Caroline, great question, uh, definitely. And I would say any of these related advocacy efforts, there has never been evidence that taking a children's environmental health lens approach or equity-driven approach towards any related industry would have a negative consequence. It's only positive. Um, so again, there's a natural protective barrier created by all of us when we think about the vulnerabilities. This is what can be sustained by a vulnerable 
person, a person living on a fence line community, person li living in an agricultural community that's constantly exposed to pesticides or many other routes of exposure. So there's um, many efforts at state levels trying to reduce exposures to pesticides, and especially in the agricultural uh, communities that maybe could be gleaned here in the state. I'm not saying it's easy. This is a huge industry. I would equate them to the tobacco industry, and I've seen it get pretty ugly in hearings I've been in. Um, they have an industry that they want to protect. I would also make the case that the frontline workers are the most exposed. So you have women, many immigrant women, um, not at all given protective gear or education on what they're exposed to. Then there's evidence of this. There's unfortunately many studies, especially in California, for example, Chamacos is a study, bringing these pesticides home to their children, you know, um, on their clothing and that kind of thing. So this cyclical generational impact it's not okay. Uh, who are we to determine who gets to live and who gets to uh, you know, have a r healthier uh, set of risk outcomes just by notion of occupational hazard or other places where people live? So I would say to that, yes, it would be amazing. There's an effort called the Pesticide, uh, Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Bill, which has been reintroduced a few times at the federal level. We don't have too many federal level child protective policies. I will say that our states have been doing much better than the federal government. Uh, but this bill, if it's able to gain uh, attraction, a lot of us have been working to get other states to senators and uh, legislators to sponsor this, would, be, would add the most protective factor that we have seen yet in this country beyond the Food Quality Protection Act from years ago, where the allowable pesticide levels on our fruits and vegetables were reduced from what a healthy male could sustain to what a child could sustain. But there's been, we've been hard pressed to see anything since that. Um, and we get, that gets fought every time it's up for renewal. So this is not a walk in the park. Uh, this is a huge industry that will fight uh, for their ability to do what they do. But the science shows us otherwise. And I think you're all seeing the legal challenges that are happening with different types of pesticides that are banned in other parts of the world but are still allowed for use here for agricultural and other uses. Uh, integrated pest management and many other practices that reduce significantly our regular use of harmful pesticides is what is being advised. It doesn't mean we can't deal with them as needed in a concerted way, targeted way, being careful about exposures and who's around, but just spraying and using as regular practice cannot be our regular, because pesticides, many forms of pesticides are known carcinogens. They're a big part of, the, and I just mentioned, a big part of exposure routes for our children in particular. Thanks, Sensei. Um, I would also mention just briefly, too, um, the, the scope of PAN includes California, which does a lot of our fruit and vegetable production. Yeah. And those pesticide application systems look a little bit differently than they do here in Iowa, where it's mostly row crop agriculture. And like that's something that I work on a lot at our center, and so I'm happy to explain sort of the differences in agricultural systems and how application and uh, exposure could work there and sort of the volume of pesticide issues that we have here in the state versus in California. It's all related and again there's that petrochemical backbone to a lot of these synthetic um, chemicals and that we are using. On that note, um, again we need water, food, air to live, non-negotiable. We are down to only a few crop cycles left from those that follow these type of things because we're doing detriment to our soil health as well. So it's our health of us, our soil health. We cannot produce the type of food that we need for the population size we have for the long term if we stay with these type of farming practices. This is exceeding my wildest dreams. Soil health is one of my favorite topics in the world. <laughs> and so if we diverge from cancer and or like make the link for cancer to soil health, I'm just going to be the linked. happiest. It's, it's all linked. linked. Okay. Um, questions from the audience before I ask my next one that I really want. Okay. Ooh. All right. We're going to go here and then we're going to go to Anne. It's not so much a, a question, uh, but a comment. It, recently I was doing some reading and I love the headline uh, with regards to cancer diagnosis and incidence. Is it more your genetic code or your zip code? Hmm. And I was like, you know, at first it made me think of inner city, you know, what they're exposed to. But now I'm thinking obviously more of our state, which is a rural state yeah. and the food that we grow. And also I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a, briefly about radon, which ha I didn't hear mentioned, yeah. and our state is, yeah. has six times the national average of indoor radon concentration. Yep. And I'm very happy to uh, announce that for those of you that might not know, that the Iowa C uh, Cancer Consortium and ACS can, we passed the Gale Orchid 
school radon safety bill this year That's so excellent. that all of our students in any public school will have their building tested. Excellent. And as a mother of a daughter, who teaches yeah. um, and having lung cancer myself that's a uh, due to radon it's a big deal so and that's huge to, and we want to elevate that for sure those are the kind of stories yeah. you want to elevate with our other states and yeah. thank you for reminding us um, again radon you cannot smell it you cannot see it right you don't know when you're being exposed so you have to be able to test and, and then, I've been and in healthcare for 40 and I've been in healthcare for 40 years so it's yep. like you know you knew radon was there yeah. but the incidence in Iowa Yes. I had no clue. Yeah. And now I sure do. Yep. And for those that don't know, the uranium in the soil then moves into the radon gas, and usually you're testing at lower basement level or first level. And again, um, it's all about finding um, the, uh, the opportunity. And then it's not cheap, you know, a couple thousand dollars to mitigate, but it, it is possible. And a lot of us are trying to work on making sure that new homes or home sales also include this type of um, screening, right? Like you would a lead uh, previous lead uh, containing house or something like that. So thank you very much. Very important piece. And again, lung, uh, radon is the number one reason for lung cancer among non-smokers. You know, so again, you're doing everything you should be doing, and just by the notion of where you happen to be spending a lot of time, could be at harm's risk. But. Thanks for your comments, and say I always enjoy hearing you talk. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying I have no financial interest in the answer to this question, uh, but I'm very curious from your perspective. Um, how I hear what you're saying where so much of environmental health is our policy frameworks are failing us and our regulatory frameworks are failing us and the government is not doing what they're supposed to be doing to protect us from environmental exposures. My question is actually about public education mm. and how we can differentiate between some of these environmental carcinogens and environmental risks um, while not having that bleed into other areas of cancer prevention. So you probably know the anti-vax movement loves to say vaccines are bad because autism and chemicals. <laughs> mm. And we're not going to vaccinate. We don't need vaccination laws. We don't need vaccination mandates. We don't need anything to do because chemicals and chemicals are bad. Okay. Uh, so how do we... How do we deal with that from a public education standpoint and differentiating for people chemi good chemical versus bad chemical and how chemicals can, contrib can promote as well as prevent public health? Mm, thank you so much. So we're very much premised on the precautionary principle, right? So up to this point, hopefully we pivot quickly. Uh, the process in the United States is that a variety, like thousands, we have, I don't know, something like 190, there's a lot of chemicals out there that we don't really know on an annual basis. They're not, again, there's no true regulation on the number of them. Ideally, they go through a review process. Maybe not all of them. It's not going to be all of them. But as long as they can show that they don't have negative health implications to people, <laughs> you know, maybe there is still a use for them. But we don't go through that rigor. In fact, the intent to do that is very much backed up at our Environmental Protection Agency for a lot of reasons. So the regulatory arm is broken here in the United States. We could look to Europe, we could look to other places that I think have been doing it better. There's never a perfect system. So the precautionary principle at least instills that you assume risk unless otherwise proven. We have reversed that right now. We are allowing anything into our market, and then unfortunately the only reason that we know that there's harm is when we see clusters, cancer clusters, or presentation of young or any patient, and by that point the prevention notion is out the door. Now you're hoping you can deal with secondary prevention and, not, uh, and, and allow that person somewhat of a quality of life, if not their life overall. So. I would offer the precautionary principle is where we need to be going. Maybe getting into the nuance of every chemical and every risk, that's too much. That's a lot. I think our regulatory system at some point needs to do that for us. But for us, there's a logical factor of if I'm going to a store and I'm buying laundry detergent or I'm buying food for my family or just basic needs, there's a lot of people out here that do believe that we have better protections than we do. You know, that there's this myth out there that the government is otherwise protecting us. And I'm not saying that there aren't positive aspects of government programming. I'm saying there isn't enough of them. <laughs> and unfortunately, we haven't reversed course on millions and millions of dollars at times spent into certain industries that are not showing return on our positive um, health here. So if we flip this on this head, change the current system, and in, in, uh, insist that chemicals are not introduced into our commerce unless otherwise proven and going through a review process for human health implications, and then on the other side of that, fine then at least we can feel a little bit better about their uses. Many of them will not go through that in a productive way. So that right there would be an incredible. Now, that's huge, and that's policy making, and that takes a long time, and a lot of us don't have that kind of time. So while that's the larger end goal, 
We'll see if we can get there. I think our states, again, the, the, the movement that our states have been doing. So that's why you're still, we all know elections matter. Your state legislators are huge in this. Who you're electing, do they understand public health side of this? Do they understand equity sides and needs of this? That certain, all of us are exposed, but certain populations have notoriously been exposed because of the work that they're doing for us most of the time. Frontline workers, the same workers that were at high risk for COVID are the same workers that are showing highest risk for these environmental considerations. Not only, there are many high wealth families that are also dealing obviously with cancers of which some are connected to environmental contrib contributions. I'm talking about the mass numbers though. So if we flip this on this head and not make the onus and responsibility to be on us as consumers, put the responsibility on those that are causing the problem in the first place, the industries that are, or the various companies that are spewing out the products with the chemicals. I hope that gets to your question. Yeah, and say so I really love the way you describe the precautionary principle as fundamentally being a change in burden of proof um, on, not on communities to prove that they're sick or getting sick, but on corporations or industry to prove that their product is safe before going to market. I just really like the way you put that. Um, I also think in, in terms of environmental justice, you know, uh, like what's coming to mind for me immediately is um, thinking about talc, talcum powder, you know, and just the outsized uh, occurrence of certain cancers in African American women mm -hmm. who use the product and sort of were pushed aside and were not listened to because of this now proven link between this product that they were using and were sort of being targeted to use over time. Yep. Um, broke that story, on, heard this on NPR on the treadmill the other day, almost cried. Um, okay. Questions, I'm gonna keep my eye out, but I wanna ask one more here. Um, you had mentioned um, the uh, uh, potential risks for women of childbearing ages mm -hmm. to you know, having their environmental exposures potentially impact several generations. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of understand how maybe one generation is impacted, but would you break down how maybe more than one generation sure. is impacted? Yeah, thank you. I mean, definitely what I've seen are grandparents, the, imp the exposure of a grandparent showing up in their grandchild, the, c the exposure pathway, which is deep, and that's been even more recent. We definitely knew parental, and I don't want to leave out our fathers, <laughs> because I think, yes, maternal child is huge, and obviously the first environment is mom's womb, but what we also now know that science has shown us easily in the last 10 years is that it's also what dad can be exposed to at young age that could show up in uh, their children later. So if that's not a huge amount of responsibility, I don't know what is. And again, no one is trying to place any blame here, right? So I'm totally standing with our oncologists. I can't even imagine what it is like to stand there in front of a family that wants to know. Hey, we have other kids at home, we wanna know. Was it this, was it my occupational hazard? Was it my smoking in the house? I mean, we've talked to oncologists who have been at, you know, unfortunately too many times at that discussion. We are not asking our oncology team to have to bear the burden of all of these exposures, but we are hoping that we have a better informed citizenry so that when families are asking, we're at least giving them some resources who can further have these discussions with them. We'll, I don't know, as, as the last speaker said, I don't know that we'll ever know each individual case, but again, when you have clusters, for example, in a, in a community, and then you tend to go backwards and find out all of these relationships were very similar, well then, in that case, you do have an exposure pathway. You might not be able to tell that story for every single person. And again, all of us as parents and community members don't want that to be the trajectory of how we figure out our, our health outcomes. That's, not, that's a totally backwards way, clearly, of doing it. It's not a humane way, I would say, either, of doing this. Thank you, Ense. Everyone, I'm not a very good moderator because I blew through the amount of time that I had for question and answers, so we have to wrap up. So can we please thank Ensei one more time. Thank you all very much for your attention.